Got a secret, can you keep it? Swear this one you'll save Better lock it in your pocket Taking this one to the grave If I show you, then I know you won't tell what I said Cause two can keep a secret if... 468 pages in 11 days Hello, and welcome to the Flotus Garden Today's book review is on... The Complete Sherlock Holmes Collection, Volume 2, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Eccentric, arrogant, and ingenious, Sherlock Holmes remains the world's most popular and influential fictional detective. In four novels and 56 short stories, Holmes, with his trusted friend Dr. Watson, steps from his comfortable quarters at 221B Baker Street into the swirling fog of London. Combining detailed observation with brilliant deduction, Holmes rescues the innocent, confounds the guilty, and solves the most perplexing puzzles crime has to offer. Volume 2 of The Complete Sherlock Holmes begins with the return of Sherlock Holmes, in which Conan Doyle resurrects his famous detective after he had killed him off in the last tale in Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. The first story in The Return features the infamously inventive explanation of how Holmes escaped certain death. Along with his last bow, The Case Book of Sherlock Holmes, and The Valley of Fear, this collection also includes a pair of parodies, The Field Bazaar and How Watson Learned the Trick, and two essays about the private life of the beloved sleuth. So I love Sherlock Holmes, maybe a little too much. And my reasoning is because of his intelligence. I love his intelligence. I love intelligence. It is very appealing to me. Sherlock has intelligence. He is also self-assured and a mastery of every situation. He has a dry sense of humor, which I also love. He's also ironic, and he loves to tell little jokes and basically to himself and just laugh with himself. He's also very eccentric, again, which I love. He also does not follow the status quo, like at all. He does his own thing. Like I cannot express how much I love Sherlock Holmes. Don't get me wrong, he does have his flaws, he is arrogant, he can be a bit conceited, he's very condescending, but when people put him in his place, he will sit there a bit shocked, but then he'll laugh. Okay, he takes it all in stride. So this book that I just finished reading started off with The Return of Sherlock Holmes, which was a part of the first collection I had read, and I will leave a link to that video down below. So instead of rereading those stories again, I just moved on to page 229, starting with The Valley of Fear. So in all technicality, there are 697 pages within the second volume, but seeing as how I started on page 229, the number of pages dropped to 468, which is still pretty impressive. In The Valley of Fear, Professor Moriarty is constantly mentioned, and I'm going to assume that it was before their big fight because Holmes had said that he had never met Moriarty before. The inspector in this story, Inspector McDonald, said, I don't take much stock of detectives and novels. Chaps that do things and never let you see how they do them, that's just inspiration, not business. I'm pretty sure that was just Sir Arthur Conan Doyle taking a shot at himself because we don't really see Sherlock's process. All we know is that he gets the information and then two seconds later he magically, not magically, figures out the crime, who did it, all that good stuff. In the story, the, his last bow, it was Holmes's final adventure. Like literally his last story. Turns out that Holmes goes into retirement to be a beekeeper. Interesting. I mean, I, I don't really have the patience for that. I'm not afraid of bees. I'm actually that one person that'll be like, ooh, a bee, and then I'll pick it up with my bare hand and transfer it to a flower. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. Holmes came out of retirement just long enough to solve a case that was at the beginning of World War I. In this story, the criminal said, I shall get level with you. If it takes me all my life, I shall get level with you. 
So basically saying, I'm going to get back at you, Holmes. Like, you ruined my scheme here. And Holmes is just smiling and said, Moriarty used to say the same thing. And I'm sitting there thinking, when? Because in volume one, we only had one story involving Professor Moriarty. And that was the story where they both fell off the cliff and we assumed that they both died. Obviously, Sherlock didn't, but Moriarty did. Like, I really am severely disappointed that there weren't more stories involving Moriarty. I would have loved to see them, like, interact with each other a lot more, plus, like, fight. It would have been super cool. So at the beginning of the casebook of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had left a note. I fear that Mr. Sherlock Holmes may become like one of those popular tenors who have outlived their time, are still tempted to make repeated farewell bows to their indulgent audiences. This must cease, and he must, go, and he must go the way of all flesh, material, or imaginary. His career has been a long one. Holmes made his debut in A Study in Scarlet and in The Sign of Four, two small booklets which appeared between 1887 and 1889. It was in 1891 that A Scandal in Bohemia the first of the long series of short stories appeared in the Strand magazine. From that date, 39 years ago, they have been produced in a broken series which now contains no fewer than 56 stories. And there remain these 12 published during the last few years which are here produced under the title of The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes was published in 1927, so that's a 40 year gap between when he first came out up until this last book. I had fully determined at the conclusion of the memoirs to bring Holmes to an end. I did the deed, but fortunately no coroner had pronounced upon the remains, and so after a long interval it was not difficult for me to respond to the flattering demand and to explain my rash act away. So basically fans were saying bring back Sherlock Holmes or we riot. And so reader, farewell to Sherlock Holmes. I thank you for your past constancy. Which is why Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had written that Sherlock Holmes was in retirement because people were rioting that he had killed him off a long time ago. Like, even I would have been mad if I had been alive at that time, okay? You can't do that to my Holmes. In the adventure of the illustrious client, Holmes said Moriarty was a dangerous man. Again, I suppose he was. We get very little information about Moriarty other than what people say. We did not get a full exposure of Moriarty ourselves. So, it is what it is. I will just move on. In the adventure of the Blanched Soldier and the adventure of the Lion's Mane, both of those stories were written through Sherlock's point of view instead of Dr. Watson, which was really fun. Unfortunately, they were not as adventurous thrilling, but I really enjoyed seeing how Sherlock's mind worked as he, his, as he processed the information and came up with the solution. The Adventure of the Three Gables, the writing style for that story felt kind of different, and some of the dialogue did not feel like stuff that Sherlock Holmes would say. In fact, some of the dialogue didn't seem like what Watson would say. And while I was reading it, I looked down at the footnotes and there was this one little asterisk that said that the story may not have been written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So throughout the entire first half of my Holmes collection, we get pretty much no emotional scenes from Sherlock Holmes. Okay, for Sherlock, Emotions, completely irrational. We do not do irrational. We do not do heart to heart, okay? We do intellectual, thinking, logic, all of that stuff. In the second half of the series, there are quite a few scenes where Sherlock Holmes becomes emotional. I don't want a mystery, Sherlock. You're being emotional understandable but unnecessary so far my favorite scenes were in the adventure of the devil's foot 
and The Adventure of the Three Garadebs. I believe I said that correctly. I actually highlighted the scenes where Sherlock was being emotional. You're being emotional. It's understandable, but unnecessary. In The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, there was some kind of poisonous substance that only worked if there was fire involved. Like if you set the powder on fire, then it would give you hallucinations. And whereas the topic of this was very interesting, it was caused by the devil's foot root. Devil's foot root does not exist. I actually looked it up. It was all fiction from Doyle's mind. But Sherlock and Watson were trying to see what the symptoms were to figure out how the people died in this story. So when they set the devil's foot root on fire, it let off this kind of gas that had them hallucinating horrible things. As Watson wrote, the turmoil within my brain was such that something must surely snap. I tried to scream and was vaguely aware of some hoarse croak which was my own voice, but distant and detached from myself. At the same moment, in some effort of escape, I broke through that cloud of despair and had a glimpse of Holmes's face, white, rigid, and drawn with horror, the very look which I had seen upon the features of the dead. It was that vision which gave me an instant of sanity and of strength. I dashed from my chair, threw my arms round Holmes, and together we lurched through the door. Upon my word, Watson, said Holmes at last with an unsteady voice, I owe you both my thanks and an apology. It was an unjustifiable experiment even for oneself, and doubly so for a friend. I am really very sorry. You know, I answered with some emotion, for I, ha I had never seen so much of Holmes's heart before. That is my greatest joy and privilege to help you. You're being emotional. It's understandable, but unnecessary. Sherlock being emotional because he put his best friend in danger. Like, I actually had to stop and reread that several times because I screamed a little bit. Like, Sherlock Holmes being emotional for once. In the adventure of the three Garadebs, Sherlock and Watson had cornered a criminal. In an instant, he had whisked out a revolver from his breast and had fired two shots. I felt a sudden hot sear as if a red-hot iron had been pressed to my thigh. There was a crash as Holmes's pistol came down on the man's head. Then my friend's wiry arms were round me. You're not hurt, Watson? For God's sake, say that you are not hurt. It was worth the wound. It was worth many wounds to know the depth of loyalty and love which lay behind that cold mask. The clear, hard eyes were dimmed for a moment, and the firm lips were shaking. For the one and only time, I caught a glimpse of a great heart as well as of a great brain. All my years of humble but single-minded service culminated in that moment of revelation. It's nothing, Holmes. It's a mere scratch. He had ripped up my trousers with his pocket knife. You are right, he cried with an immense sigh of relief. His face set like a flint as he glared at our prisoner. If you had killed Watson, you would not have got out of this room alive. You're being emotional. It's understandable, but unnecessary. Sherlock being emotional. I cannot express how much I love that. Honestly, I am really sad that I am finished with the canonical stories of Sherlock Holmes, but I am looking forward to the rest of my Sherlock Holmes collection. I am not giving this book a rating because it's Sherlock Holmes. I automatically love it. I love Sherlock. To conclude, I did use Sherlock Holmes for a book bingo. The main character is older than me. He's, he is older than me, not by much, but he is. And with that, I now have full five square bingo. So that's all I have to say on Sherlock Holmes for now. I'll see you next time. Bye.